Good morning, everyone. Please take your seats. Uh, Great to see you this morning. Uh, We're diving back into our series on the book of Ruth today. Uh, We'll be focusing on chapter three for now, and then the last chapter will be online next Sunday uh, for church at rest. Uh, Before we get into it, let's have a quick recap of everything that has happened so far. So in chapter one, we met Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons who left Bethlehem because of a famine. Uh, Seems reasonable to us, uh, but remember, Moab was an evil enemy city. Uh, Lots of false gods, immorality, and corruption. Elimelech suddenly passes away, leaving Naomi as a widow, and then her two sons abandon their heritage by marrying Ruth and Orpah, two Moabite women. Uh, Ten years later, tragedy strikes again. Uh, Both sons die, meaning that all three women were now left uh, grieving and vulnerable. Naomi hears that the famine in Israel has ended, so she plans to go back home. Uh, Orpah remains in Moab and says goodbye, uh, but Ruth is determined to stay with Naomi. Uh, With such loyalty and love, she says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. We found that Ruth had come to trust in the God of Israel, leaving Naomi no choice but for them to return back home together. And so both characters are mourning, bitter, and broke. Everything seems to end on a sad note in chapter 1, but then the last verse offers us a glimmer of hope. It's a new season in Israel, spring has come, and harvest time is approaching. In chapter 2, we are introduced to Boaz, a godly man of wealth and influence. Uh, He owns several fields, and it's here that Ruth starts working for him. Uh, gleaning from anything that was left behind by the harvesters. We discover that Boaz is more than just a nice guy, though. He is also a potential kinsman or family redeemer. Uh, To make things more interesting, he and Ruth also seem to hit it off. Uh, Boaz was older. Apparently, he aged like a fine wine uh, because they care for each other. And Ruth is particularly touched by his support because she is a foreigner. Uh, She would have never expected to be looked after so well. They went far beyond her expectations. So all of this leads Naomi to come away from her bitterness and say in verse 20, God has not stopped showing his kindness. The arrival of Boaz has changed everything. And so chapter 2 ends with a sense of hope and excitement hanging in the air. We're left wondering how things will unfold now that there is a hint of love and possibility in the story. That is what brings us to chapter 3. So let's listen to it now and see what happens next. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now, do as I tell you. Take a bath and put on perfume and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking, I was in good spirits. He lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me for you are my family redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary, for everyone in town knows you are a virtuous woman. But while it is true that I am one of your family redeemers, 
there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I will talk to him. If he is willing to redeem you, very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until the morning. But she got up before it was light, enough for people to recognize each other. For Boaz had said, No one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. Then Boaz said to her, Bring your cloak and spread it out. He measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back, and then he returned to the town. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, What happened, my daughter? Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her, and she added, He gave me these six scoops of barley and said, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said to her, Just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. The man won't rest until he has settled things today. Okay, I think we can be honest with each other and say that this part of Scripture is pretty weird, uh, to say the least. Um, this chapter doesn't tend to pop up on our phones for verse of the day. And you might be wondering what we can really learn from this text. Uh, if it makes you feel better, that was my question at the start of the week too. Uh, but let's go through it together, and I'm sure that we'll be able to make some sense of it. First off, let's remember why Boaz, being a potential kinsman redeemer, mattered so much. Uh, if you've forgotten what that is, a kinsman redeemer was the closest male relative of a father or husband. If anything happens to either of those individuals, like it had to Elimelech, uh, the kinsman redeemer had the legal right to step in and care for those left behind. Uh, if the widow was childless, the kinsman redeemer could marry her uh, because this would provide an heir for the family. And so Elimelech, as a relative of Boaz, could fulfill this role if he wanted to. Uh, so Boaz could fulfill this role if he wanted to. It was a very different world to what we live in today, but it shows us why this potential connection mattered so much. Without Boaz, Naomi and Ruth would have remained at such risk and in poverty. We also need to remember that although Ruth and Boaz seemed to hit it off, their relationship hadn't progressed into anything official. As we saw last week, sparks were flying, but Boaz was yet to make a move. So as you can imagine, both Naomi and Ruth were talking and probably wondering, what's going on? Are we friends? Are we more than friends? Uh, do you really think he likes me? What do you think is with the holdup? Uh, this is my guess. I'll be honest, I have no idea how these conversations go. Um, but the point is, this relationship needed some clarity and defining, particularly because the clock was ticking. It had been six to seven weeks, meaning that the harvest season was coming to an end. Every day, Ruth would come home from work to Naomi asking, did you see Boaz? Did he talk to you? Did he ask for your number? Do you still think he's interested? All of that kind of stuff. And that's because Naomi knew that Ruth and Boaz would end up going their separate ways after the harvest season if their relationship didn't progress into something official. So at all this time, Naomi, and perhaps us as well, are left waiting uh, with bated breath. Will there be love? Will there be romance? Will this man step in and bring about Ruth's redemption? This is what we need to keep in mind as we go through chapter 3. And as we explore this passage, we can see that it fits nicely into three different points of view, uh, starting with Naomi's. She has grown tired of waiting and wandering, and so she takes matters into her own hands and says to Ruth, shouldn't I find a proper home for you? You need a partner. How about Boaz? We think he likes you. He's wealthy. He ticks the boxes. We'll have wheat for the rest of our lives. Uh, most importantly, he's our kinsman redeemer who can save us. So let's make this happen. Now, there was nothing wrong with Naomi pushing for a marriage here. It was actually quite common for a widow to marry a relative of their late husband, and arranged marriages were also the norm. But the method which Naomi comes up with is unconventional, to say the least. She wants Ruth to lie beside Boaz during the night, but first she needs to freshen up. In verse 3, Naomi says, Ruth, wash yourself. You've been in the fields all day. You smell awful. Uh, go take a bath. 
While you're at it, put on some perfume, grab your Chanel number no. five and spray all over. You've got to smell wonderful tonight. After that, change your clothes. Get out of that muddy work here. It's dirty and horrible. Put on something nice that will catch Boaz's attention. And then finally, Ruth tell, uh, Naomi tells Ruth to wait for Boaz until he has had his meal and a couple of drinks. As a valuable lesson for us all here, never approach a big subject with someone if they're hungry. They will never go well. You have to catch them at the right moment. Um, but Ruth has her instructions. She needs to uh, get ready and then to be specific. Naomi says in verse 4, Notice where Boaz lies down and then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. As I said, this is unconventional. Uh, it's obvious that Naomi wants to secure uh, Boaz for Ruth, but what's not clear is why she goes about it in this way. On the one hand, it's possible that Naomi was being devious. Perhaps she wanted Ruth to throw herself at Boaz sexually. Uh, if they slept together, their connection would deepen and it would increase the chances of them getting married. That's one way to look at it. The other possibility is that Naomi was so trusting in both Ruth and Boaz's character that she was sure they would handle themselves respectfully. Even though she was creating such a tempting situation, perhaps she believed they would keep good boundaries and honor God's call for purity. Why not go for a straightforward conversation with Boaz? Uh, was Naomi unaware of the risks? Did she want that to happen? We don't know. Uh, the author of Ruth doesn't tell us the motivation behind Naomi's plan. But however we choose to look at her and whatever position we take, what is clear is that God continues to guide Ruth's story, whether that's in light of Naomi's attitude or in spite of it. We see that in the following verses as we move on to Ruth's point of view. She says with obedience in verse 5, Naomi, I will do everything you say. It's worth highlighting again here that Ruth isn't from Israel. She probably has no idea what customs, rituals, and traditions exist when it comes to Jewish marriage and kinsmen redeemers. So it's very possible that she was just acting on trust. She's been told by Naomi that she should marry, that Boaz is the best option, and this is the way for her to make it known that she's open to marriage. So she follows the plan step by step, and then as it draws near to midnight, she goes down to the threshing floor to meet Boaz. How does he respond? Well, let's move over to his perspective. It's been a hard day of work. The evening had been enjoyable, lots of uh, food to eat and lots of drinks had as well. But now Boaz lies on the floor to sleep. Uh, a gentle breeze blows through the air and it's cold. So Boaz looks down to pull his blanket up, but then suddenly notices a woman lying at his feet. Not just any woman, she is also young and attractive too. So he rubs his eyes and asks who's there because it's dark and he's feeling dazed. We all are when we first wake up. And here we enter a really pivotal moment because this part of Naomi's plan was so risky. You see, during the harvest season, it was common for prostitutes to come in from the town and offer themselves to the men working in the fields. Uh, this practice is actually described at the beginning of Hosea chapter 9. So when Boaz wakes up and finds a woman lying beneath him, there was a very real chance that he could have misunderstood the situation. He might have thought that it was a prostitute and slept with her. He could have realized it was Ruth, thought that she was a prostitute, and damaged any chances of a potential marriage. And so he asked the question, who is there? Who is that lying at my feet? This is like the countdown before the explosion in Oppenheimer, if you've seen it. Uh, we're waiting to see which way the story will go, because right now everything is hanging in the balance. But Ruth quickly identifies herself and then goes on to say, Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. Now what does that mean? Well, if you have a good memory, you'll remember that that resonates with Boaz's prayer for Ruth back in chapter 2 when they first met. He said, May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Uh, the connection becomes clearer for us to see when we read it in the ESV translation, which records Ruth's words as, Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. 
So when we bring all of these connections together, we find that Ruth was essentially declaring her love for Boaz and asking him to be the answer to his own prayer by taking her hand in marriage. The only other place in the Old Testament where we find this kind of uh, intimate language is in Ezekiel 16. God describes Israel as his wife and says, I wrapped my cloak around you to cover your nakedness and declared my marriage vows. I made a covenant with you, says the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. So this was not a casual hookup or a fleeting sexual encounter. It was a deeply meaningful moment of love and commitment where Ruth was saying, you are the redeemer. You can save us from harm, uphold our family name and provide us with the security we need. I want to be your wife. I want to be the one who you give your loyalty and faithfulness to in a marriage covenant, just like the Lord with Israel, his chosen nation. Now, as you can imagine, it's quite a strange way to be woken up. Uh, Boaz probably felt a mixture of shock and excitement. Maybe he thought he was dreaming because there was such an attractive woman now asking to be his wife. Um, so how does he respond? Well, from verse 10, we see that Boaz blesses Ruth and admires her for her actions. He knows that she could have picked any man for herself, but has chosen him not just because of her feelings, but also because of what it meant for Naomi. If they were to marry she would be kept safe by extension as well. And so this was yet another demonstration of Ruth's loyalty and family care, and Boaz appreciated it. To be honest, it's quite clear that these two had a strong connection, and so we might be wondering why Boaz hadn't made a move beforehand. But he reveals that to us in verse 12. There was another man who is even more closely related to Elimelech than Boaz, meaning that he was not the first in line to redeem Ruth. Now this is where the sad piano music kicks in, the rain starts to pour, because this was a bit of a crisis. This other family member, perhaps an older brother or a cousin of Boaz, reserved the right to, to claim Ruth for himself if he wanted to. This, of course, would stop Ruth and Boaz from ever getting married, so they would have been heartbroken. But Boaz responds, now certain of Ruth's commitment to him, and pledges to speak to the man in the morning. Uh, if he is not interested in redeeming Ruth, or if he is unable to, then Boaz makes it clear that he will step up without hesitation. It all just depends on their conversation in the morning. So this part of the story is a bit of a roller coaster. It's a whirlwind of emotions. Uh, Ruth and Boaz are clearly in love, they're alone, they're on the verge of marriage, but are then suddenly faced with this bad news that puts their plans on hold. It would have been so easy for them to let their feelings take over, forget about the legalities, and just do what probably felt like the most natural thing to do and embrace each other. But listen to the particular wording of verse 14. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until the morning. In other words, the author is telling us that this never evolved into a sexual situation. It never took a physical turn. Just picture the scene. Boaz and Ruth are under the night sky. They've poured out their hearts to one another. It's gone midnight. He loves her. She loves him. They want to get married. If they were to do anything, no one would ever know. And yet, they still choose purity. And they embrace self-control out of reverence for God's law and respect for one another. Despite the temptation, despite the potential secrecy, they put God first and choose to wait until the time is right, knowing that that time may never even come. <coughs> Boaz also tells Ruth to leave early in the morning. He's protecting her from any uh, gossip or misunderstanding. And when she go does go home... Uh, he ensures that it's not empty-handed, but with six scoops of barley so that she and Naomi were provided for. So in the end, in spite of its apparent appearance and the potential motivations behind this moment, we find nothing but righteous choices from both Ruth and Boaz. Their actions reflect their commitment to honor God and one another, even in what would have been such a tempting situation under the stars. So how does this chapter come to a close? 
Well, picture a very anxious Naomi uh, waiting to hear every single detail on the edge of her seat. As soon as Ruth comes through the door, Naomi immediately asks her, what happened? Tell me everything. I've been a ball of nerves. How did it go? And interestingly, this question from Naomi is quite difficult to translate from its original Hebrew into English. It can actually be interpreted as, who are you? Which sounds strange to us until we remember what Naomi was hoping for this entire time. She was essentially asking Ruth, do I have a Mrs. Boaz before me or not? Is it a done deal? So Ruth tells her everything and then hands over the gift from Boaz. Perhaps this was his way of saying, thank you for setting me up or giving me a chance with your lovely daughter-in-law. But even still, they both need to wait a little longer until this conversation with this other family member. Will Boaz be able to step in and redeem Ruth? Will they be able to marry? Are they allowed to love? Or will Ruth be thrown into the house of another man, this other family member? And if so, what will this mean for Naomi? These are the questions which the two of them are left wondering. And that's exactly where we are left to. Next Sunday, we turn to chapter 4 to see how the rest of the story pans out. But before we come to an end, what can we take away for ourselves? What points can we find here for our faith? Well, to start, there are some interesting parallels which we can draw out between Ruth's encounter with Boaz and our relationship with God. Uh, Boaz was Ruth's kinsman redeemer. Jesus is our one true redeemer. Ruth could have chosen any man, but she went to the only one who could save her. In the same way, we can look to all kinds of wrong to try and find a fulfillment and pleasure. In fact, on this topic, C.S. Lewis writes, all of human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. But this reminds us to only ever go to God because he is the only one who can truly give us satisfaction and a real sense of joy. Another parallel we can find, Naomi told Ruth to wash herself before being with Boaz. We live in a world where it is so easy to become uh, messy and dirty, pulled into all of the wrong things which we know we shouldn't. But the Bible guides us and shows us how to respond. Uh, At the start of Psalm 51, David prays, God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt, And purify me from my sin. Now, this is a prayer which we can make our own, asking God to cleanse and forgive us because we know and believe that He is loving and compassionate to us. Naomi also told Ruth to anoint herself with perfume. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we find that our lives are like a Christ like fragrance rising up to God. In 1 John, we also read that we have been anointed by God with his Holy Spirit. And so here we can see the connection for us to seek the Spirit in our lives because this makes sure that uh, our Christ-like fragrance continues to rise up to God and positively influence all of the people around us. And lastly, Naomi told Ruth to change her clothes. Uh, Boaz first notices Ruth when she is dirty and wearing her uh, muddy field gear, Uh, much like how Jesus sees us and loves us. Uh, when we are sinful and at our worst. But here is the change. When we call on him to be our saviour, we are told that he clothes us in his righteousness. Isaiah writes, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. And we also find this idea in Ephesians 4, where salvation is pictured as the changing of clothes Uh, Paul instructs us to take off the old self and to put on the new. So here we have these parallels reminding us to be washed, anointed, and to embrace our robes of righteousness. But there is a far deeper challenge for us to find here, uh, and it's to do with our integrity. Think back once again to Ruth and Boaz. They were alone, in love, and had every opportunity to rush into things before the timing was right. They could have put their personal desires ahead of everything else and acted for themselves. But instead, we find that they chose faithfulness to God and to one another, showing us their integrity. 
when it comes to our lives, I wonder what situations we find ourselves in where our character is tested like this. Not only in a sexual way, but any area where our self-control and loyalty to God is called into question. How do we get on then? When no one else is looking. When we know we can get away with it. When we hold the power. When we are in love. When it feels natural. When we feel drawn towards something even though we know it is wrong. How well does our integrity and our commitment to God hold up in those moments? James Emery White, a pastor from Chicago, writes, Character isn't tested in the light of day, but in the dark of night. And so when we are alone and covered by the shadows and the darkness, as if it were, let's aim to follow the example of both Ruth and Boaz by responding with integrity. John Piper captures it all well, and he writes, The mood of today is if it feels good, do it. To hell with your principles of restraint and faithfulness. But I say to you, if the stars are shining in their beauty and you are alone in the privacy of your place, stop for the sake of righteousness. Let the morning dawn on your purity. Don't be like the world. Be like Boaz. Be like Ruth. Powerful in self-control. Committed to righteousness. Determined to put God first in everything that we do. It presents a difficult challenge to us. It's a tough ask. But that is what we find when we uncover the meaning of Ruth chapter 3. Because integrity is not who we are in the light of day, but who we become when no one else is looking. Let me pray for us as we close. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for Ruth and Boaz's example, and for the way in which we can see how you moved in their lives. As we've explored the events of chapter 3, we see your call to be washed clean from our sin, carrying the fragrance of your Son, and dressed in your robes of righteousness. We thank you for this, Father, and we ask that you help us to live in the light of our faith, And Father, we also see in this story the importance of integrity, of the great needs to make faithful choices that are pleasing to you. May you give us the strength and the conviction to honour you with our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, all that we do, whether that's in the light of day or in the darkness of night. And if we find ourselves in a period of waiting, where the path ahead is unclear or discouraging, just like it was for Ruth and Naomi. May you give us the patience and the trust to know that your plan and your timing is perfect. Help us to lean on you always for guidance. And may you continue to speak to us as we enter this new week, giving us strength and grace as we look to apply what your word teaches us. We ask all of this in the name of our Saviour Jesus. Amen.